Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Eating Crow podcast. I'm joined today by Kevin Miller, a common name but a very uncommon person. <laughs> Kevin, good to have you on the program. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So your content is uh, is raw on LinkedIn, which is how we discovered each other. Uh, but there's so much more to your background, uh, the company you founded and, and are growing successfully today. But how you got there is kind of an interesting story. So we'll drill into that. But first, tell us, you know, tell us what you're doing at, at Grow today, how that got started, and maybe a little bit more about your background while we jump in. Sure. So, <clears throat> yeah, so Grow is a digital marketing agency based here in Los Angeles. And um, I'm the co-founder and CEO. I've got one partner. Um, his name is John. And we started it in February of, or I quit my job, which was a director of growth at Open Door in February of 2020. So just before um, COVID-19 hit the United States. And uh, so we've been around for a little over two years and um, we've grown to uh, just about 100 full-time employees and about 300 clients. And again, exclusively focused just on search engine optimization. So it's been really a, a wild, you know, wild ride building that. Prior to that, um, I grew up in Ormond Beach, Florida, which is a suburb just outside of Daytona Beach. I went to college at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and then um, I moved straight to San Francisco because I became obsessed with technology startups, I always wanted to work at one. So I worked at several startups that um, you would have never heard of. And I worked at one which is no longer a startup and it's called Google. I was there for two years and then worked at Open Door, as I mentioned. So kind of been all over the place. In my young career, I think I worked at six or seven different places before starting Grow. Right. And then everyone will tell you starting a company in February 2020 is a great idea. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Well, you know what? I'm honestly very grateful for it because I probably would have gotten too scared. I probably wouldn't have done this. Oh, yeah. But that decision was made for me. So I'm very thankful for it because of that reason. Well, and you, you happen to pick probably the right industry, too. Yes. And, you know, what's so surprising about that is I thought that everyone was already fully online, but there was another dimension to be unlocked that, that we've now seen. And I was yeah. shocked with how much, how much we really weren't. And when I say we, I mean just like general population of retailers. Yeah. You know, they really weren't online in the way that they are today. It's really, really dramatic, the shift that was, you know, forced upon us. And so we had about a month where no one would sign up with Grow. And this was when we were just starting. So it was very nerve wracking. But then it came in droves, you know, and really, you know, it started to accelerate. And then in addition to that, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the IDFA changes, which is like the privacy changes that Apple made. Yeah. And that was a that was another accelerant. So those were two yeah. macro currents that were in our favor, which again, just luck of entrepreneurship. You know, I'm sure we'll have a couple things that go the other way too, but those were two that helped put us in a position to be successful. Well, and, and SEO, uh, search engine optimization is a it's a black art, right? I mean, it's 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 art, it's science, it's technology, it's smart people. So it's not something that necessarily can be automated or templated and it always it's always changing so you guys have put yourself in a position to kind of be at the forefront and and you have to wake up and look at it every day because your clients can't right right isn't that part of the value problem it is and i think yeah. the reason that it's considered a dark art is because google doesn't tell the general population of marketers exactly how to rank well on google search <laughs> because that you know that's their core competency their the, the integrity of their ranking algorithm is the most proprietary and confidential thing you know that exists at google that being said we have had a lot of success educating people on what we know which is the basics which is that google likes it when you answer questions for consumers in a very thorough and detailed way and that's how we do our content writing so we don't have to be the smartest people in the world we don't have to be um, you know, former Google engineers to do a, a great job at SEO for our brands. Like we really just do that, those fundamentals, those basics as we answer questions that relate to, um, you know, what our companies are selling. And that seems to be working sure. really well. And I, and, and the reason we, we had strong conviction around that is because we knew that the purpose of Google ultimately is to organize the world's information and pre give the best answer to the consumer. So that's all we think about when we do our writing is like, can, are we answering this question better than anyone else has before? And if we are, then it probably deserves to rank on page one of Google. Sure. Excellent. 
Um, the, by the way, the growth is astounding. I mean, in, in a sense, you've added 100 employees from out of nowhere in a year. It's just unreal. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, you see these gray hairs on the side of my head? I didn't have those when that's when we started Grow. So that's probably... <laughs> I'd take gray hair. I'd take gray hair right now, Kevin. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, no, I mean, um, the, the truth is we had a lot of people helping us, you know. It's not just been, yeah. it's not that my my co-founder and I are geniuses or we're better than other people. Honestly, we had a lot of, we, we both were working in digital marketing for seven or eight years in, independently. We made great relationships. We have a lot of advisors. We didn't raise money for Grow, but it's, it's a bootstrap company. But we have 10 advisors that are all really high-powered individuals that are well-networked that send us business. And so that was a, uh, you know, a big, big thing as well. And in, in our business, it just matters how well networked are you to get the business or independent originally, and then how good of a job do you do to then get referrals from existing customers? And those are the two things we've done yeah. well is like, most of the growth comes from people who already work with us that say, will you do this for my friend? Well, I'll tell you, I've actually gone through a bit of the sales process with your team. And I think the referral process is one thing, but like you said, you got to execute. And then when you put people on the phone with a potential client, it has to be a good experience. Yes. So, I mean, I can, I can speak that it has been a good experience. Very intelligent people, um, all younger than my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have children older than your team. Yes. It's shocking, yes. but um, it, that has to work. It has to work. You have to feel comfortable because the reason people are, are enlisting you is they don't know what to do, right. right? And it's uncomfortable to give people money if they don't understand what they're getting totally. or how it works. Totally. But we, yeah. that's where our, what we take pride in doing is explaining to people how it works. A lot of people in the SEO sure. industry try to play into the fact that it is the dark art, as you said. But that's not, sure. that, that's not something we subscribe to anymore as an organization. Like, people want to know what they're paying for. The only way you can get their buy-in, which is critical for them to continue to be a customer, is if you explain it in layman's terms and they understand it. So I just try to explain it like, you know, how would I explain to my dad what I do for work? You know, that's how we treat it for mm -hmm. just like, I don't understand how to do inventory management, right? That's incredibly complex <laughs> and you got to be an Excel wizard. I don't ask the client yeah. to explain that to me, you know, and then, sure. so we try to be ultra transparent and just get them really, our goal is to make, like turn you Pete into an SEO nerd. I want you as okay. my client to be an SEO nerd. And become obsessed with it because then you'll want to talk to us more. You'll want to get deeper, you know. So that's sure. that's how we treat it, rather than, you know, hey, don't worry about it. We're gonna handle it. That's that doesn't yeah. that that we don't want to be a part of that type of business. Business. So Kevin, I want to shift gears and talk briefly about how you kind of got the buzz in this whole marketing thing and how you got started. So there's an interesting story about how you uh, let's just say monetized an Uber promotion. And uh, and got the attention of, of a couple of people that said this guy's pretty sharp. Um, I want to I might want to get him involved in some of my businesses. Walk us through that. Yeah. So in 2014, I was living in San Francisco. I had no money, but um, I didn't have a car. I really needed to get around, and that was when Uber was you know taking okay. off. I think it was founded two years prior, and um, I was learning all about Google AdWords. Became good at running campaigns for small and medium businesses. And I decided Uber came out with a give 20, get 20 promotion. So if I give you my code, Pete, and you take your first ride, you get $20 off of your first ride, and I also get $20 off of a future ride. And so what I did was I built a website that took me, you know, one hour. It's actually still up. It's called uberfreerides.wordpress.com. So I didn't even pay for a real domain. It's a free hosted, and if you go to the website, it'll show that it's, it was last modified eight years ago. And um, it has a picture of an Uber driver, like a stock image, and it has the latest promo code that I was using. And I would spend you know, money in, on ads, my own money in Google ads. And if I spent $1 in ad spend, I'd get about $20 in, in credit. So Okay, great return. I started to do this, yeah. So I was bidding on terms like Uber, Uber fr promo code, Uber you know, free ride. And I was paying about five cents per click, which is like basically the lowest, cheapest inventory that exists on Google. And um, I started doing it for my my sisters, and I did it for my brother, my my bro my dad, because he was traveling to New York from Florida a lot. And then my brother asked me if I would do it for some of his old college roommates. I said sure. One of those college roommates had a startup that was funded by 
a pretty prominent venture capitalist. And so he he asked me, can I introduce you to this guy? He would love to learn about what you're doing. Talked to him. His name is Jeff Lowe. He founded a company called Arena Ventures and has done a bunch of other uh, pretty high-profile investments. And we just got along incredibly well. Um, became like fast friends because we have the same entrepreneurial methodologies. And he just said to me, mm-hmm. look, take my credit card and as long as it's ROI positive, spend as much as you want. So I think I spent, you know, 50 grand over like a, a two month period of time. And he ended up getting so much Uber credit, he had to buy multiple iPhones and create multiple Uber accounts. And so wow. I think we generated, you know, just for him, probably about a quarter million dollars in Uber credit. And um, wow. Uber started to catch on to this and they changed their terms of service. And so they banned me from using the service. I'm still banned today. I actually can't download the app. I can't use the service. So. I, I jumped on the Lyft bandwagon. But what that experience taught me was, um, you know, that digital marketing is really interesting and there's there's arbitrage to be, you know, uh, executed and or like taken advantage of. And so that kind of led me on my path. And through that relationship with Jeff, um, you know, because I just didn't really, I didn't bill him or ask him for anything in return. Sure. I just wanted to, you know, see what the experience would be like. He then set me up to be the first marketing employee at a company called Open Listings. That's why I moved to Los Angeles five years ago. That I, I ended up doing that, I made that move. That company got acquired by Open Door. And, um, okay. and Jeff is a current advisor in Grow. So he's kind of been with me the entire time and, and championed me and helped me in my career. I mean, that's, well, first of all, the, the fact that you were so curious, you moved to San Francisco, then created something out of nothing grew it, took some chances, and then got your shot is awesome. And it's great that, that that Jeff is still with you today, right? He's still an advisor at Grow, and you guys yeah. built some trust. As David Letterman used to say, you might not even have ever watched David. I did, I did, I did. I'm not that Kevin, young. I don't even know. I'm turning 30, 31 on okay. Thursday. Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that's right. I saw that. Happy birthday Thank you. early. Um, there's more to the story, right? So part of the, part of the draw and you're very open about this, which I appreciate because I think it's helpful. And it's part of this. This is the point of our program, right? Eating crow. You had a couple different moments in your life where you literally had to say, Hey, wait a minute, this isn't working. I've got to do something different. And you share it so inspirationally with other people because you're so open, right? And you welcome people who've had similar challenges and recognize that does not define them where for a lot of other people, it does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So talk about this, this path of redemption, so to speak, and kind of step us back to where it started in, in where, where it's led you today. Yeah. So, you know, I had a serious and still have a serious battle with addiction and substance abuse. And so for me, you know, I got sober on March 1st, 2016, but the story started, you know, in 2007, 2008, when I was in high school, started using Oxycontin and Xanax recreationally. And for me, I'm just a, it's, it's a, the reason I want to be so open about talking about my recovery story is because for me, mm-hmm. after you physically, after I physically detoxed from the substances, it became a mental game. Your body no longer physically needs, you know, the drugs and the alcohol, you, but you mentally crave it. And for me, I was trying to overcome the social stigma of being an addict or being an alcoholic. And I couldn't stomach it. I just couldn't stomach it. To me, being an addict or an alcoholic meant you were homeless on the side of the street or you had like a terrible story of something that went really, really wrong in your life. And and uh, you were looked at as like an outcast or a black sheep. And I, I just couldn't accept that. You know, I, I tried to just drink uh, normally for multiple years when I was in San Francisco and it always led me back to the harder drug use. So... After repeated efforts, you know, I learned that I really am an alcoholic, you know, and um, I started to go to AA meetings and my life started to change once I accepted the fact that I had this problem. And if I wanted to be successful, not just professionally, but personally, which to me is much more important, um, I wouldn't be able to Mm -hmm. engage in those activities. You know, I'd have to become comfortable going to happy hours or celebrating holidays or doing anything without drugs and alcohol, you know, and... um, It still is very difficult, you know. I mean, I'm going to an AA meeting tonight in person, and I had one this morning on Zoom. So it's a daily thing, um, and but I like to talk about it because 
I couldn't find anyone when I was trying to get sober that was in the business world that was talking about it openly. And I always felt embarrassed by it. I always felt like it was something that I should be ashamed of. Um, and I never felt comfortable in my own skin talking about it. So I'm hoping that someone can read my story or hear this and think, you know, I can be successful in business and it's not going to be something that I should be embarrassed or ashamed about. I can be confident about it. You know, to me, this is a little bit, you know, um, corny for lack of a better word, but truly if it reaches one person who is going to be an entrepreneur and, and, and can have the courage to do it sober, you know, it's worth it for me to tell the story publicly. Uh, because I just didn't have that. I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't find that. I, I saw a few celebrity stories, which I love. I love when people come out and talk about that, but there was very few in the business world. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, and the reason it's so special to me is I met my business partner in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's also sober. So I've got a little over six years. He's got five years and, and change. So there's a, there's a lot that we do culturally at Grow that emanates from, you know, from the, the sober sort of way of life, which just, you know, in, in simple terms, just means like, be honest, be transparent, be forthright, you know, have integrity, basically. And so, you know, it's helped us build a company that we think is healthy inside and out. You know, there's so much to consider there. One of the first things you said that I don't know if a lot of people really realize is that your body kicked it before your brain ever will. Yeah, your brain, your brain, right. it, your brain pretty much always will. Some people have the yeah. obsession lifted. That's what they call it. But the obsession can return the next day. It's very. That's why it's a daily thing. Sure. And you got to be yeah. able to have the well, and tools you, to fight it off. Well, and you, you made such a good point. I, I, this was, there's several things about you being able to be open about it with your employees, your family, and everybody is otherwise people tried to battle this in secret. Yeah. Right? They didn't want people to know they were going to an AA meeting, which imagine the stress that you have to deal with every day to try to keep that compartmentalized. It's now tough. that you can be open about it, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's such a, tr and by the way, I see a lot of people paying lip service to this. Yeah. But I see very few people actually out on the front line saying, hey, I, this was me, and now I'm going to create a company and create a culture that allows people to thrive. And by the way, it's the two founders. And now that you're open about the fact that, look, we got to go to battle every day. This isn't easy for yeah. us, right? Yeah. And, and transparency, honesty, forthright, integrity, all those things you mentioned, you got to make that fabric, right? That's not just – those aren't buzzwords hanging on a wall somewhere, right? No, they're not. And even just being on this – podcast with you you know like this is another piece in my insurance bank now i'm accountable to you you know because i've yeah. told you i'm sober so it's like it's a it's it's been very helpful for me to speak out openly about it. it's given me the encouragement to keep going myself um but it's just changed a lot of my you know my relationships with my parents and my siblings and most importantly with myself you know because That's right. I just feel better about myself. I have greater self-esteem, greater self-worth. And, um, you know, I didn't go to jail. I didn't overdose. That's the story of a lot of people I know. Luckily, I didn't. But that doesn't mean that if I was to relapse, that wouldn't happen. You know, so try to just remain yeah. humble in that because so many times people just, you know, go, uh, go out for a day or two and then they, you know, and they're gone. So... I don't take it. Yeah, and, and you're so right. I, I, I've experienced this. I, I had a, a, a co-worker, a gentleman I, that, that I did my first startup together, and it was the two of us and a dog in a garage for a few years, and he had an issue. And it came back and bit him a couple times. Yep. And, you know, and, and he's lucky to be alive. But, you know, I had developed a relationship that I was cheering for him and, and was able to stand by him because there was a high amount of trust there. And, and he, he opened up the world you're living in, Kevin, that I probably hadn't experienced firsthand like you did. Yeah. And you mentioned your parents and your siblings. There were, you know, obviously challenges there, but now that they're all in with you and your coworkers and everybody, like you said, you've got this accountability team who's not only going to hold you accountable, but they're rooting for you. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Right? They're, they're rooting for yep. you. Yep. 
Yep. So th- walk us through that that this you know letting your parents know where you're at and how, and and their participation helping you come out of that. Well, I think it was, you know, well first of all, my grandma was an alcoholic and my uncle mm. was an addict and and my cousin died from a heroin overdose. So when I was growing up, okay. I knew that this was in my family, but that didn't matter to me. My mom kept reminding me, but I just didn't think. There's a common theme with alcoholics is that we think we're the exception to the rule and things don't apply to us, which is why it gets very confusing sure. with entrepreneurship because that's a that's a quality that is often um, championed, you know, and really welcomed, but it can be dangerous. Right. You know, there's a very thin line, as you saw with like the founder of Uber. I don't know if you've been seeing his his story and watched his show, Super Pumped. Like you know, yeah. that the ego won with Travis and um, it got him. You know, took over his entire life. It's very dangerous. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I was gone. You know, I was out of the house. I left for college, and then I left, you know, for California. So my parents really didn't know. I was very, very good at hiding it, especially that far away. When I was in Florida, though, there was multiple incidents where they came to find out what was going on. It was very hard to, to hide it. But um, my parents were very supportive because they had some experience with my, and my mom in particular had experience with her siblings and her nephew. Uh, and my dad was as well. I, I don't think he understood it to the extent that my mom did. Um, cause for him, he comes from like that old school Jewish Syracuse background. Like you got a problem, just stop mm-hmm. it, cut it off. Cold turkey. Yeah. You know, sure. that, that was my brother's viewpoint too. Everybody views it differently. And, and for, um, uh, most people, I totally get it. Yeah. Just, this is going to kill you. It's really a thing that's, you know, terrible in your life. So just stop it. Just doesn't work like that for, for addicts. If we could, we, we would, you know. So it took a while to rebuild those relationships. But in the ninth step of AAA, you make an amends to those you might have harmed. And each one of my family members was on that list. So I got a chance to go speak with them about it and learn how my actions affected them. And we moved past it in a positive way. Yeah. So that's, and I'm sure, that's what I, I'm sure that wasn't one conversation, right? I'm sure that was... That you know, you could have that meeting, yeah. But then they've got to see that you're in, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, those formal conversations happen, you know, one time, and then it's a limiting amends from there. So, mm-hmm. you know, staying sober while I am uh, not, you know, under surveillance, <laughs> you know, or or like with them yeah. at all times. That that's the living amends. Did, did I really mean what I said? So. Kevin, when you when you consider the team, you, you like you said, you've grown to 100 people in a very fast period of time. How do you guys approach this kind of a discussion with a potential new hire? Right. Well, um, let's say they've got a gap in their resume, and they say, "Hey, Kevin, you know, I was in I was in treatment for six months here, and you know I'm still battling it." That has to change the dialogue, and it has to it has to make someone just go, "Oh, thank God, they understand." Yeah. Yeah. Well, my co-founder and I do the final interviews with every single potential full-time employee. And on those interviews, we tell them that we're both sober. And we explain the culture and the reason behind it. And we tell them what we were addicted to and the fact that this is our plan to stay in good standing. Um, okay. And so that opens the door for people to, to let us know about things in their life. So, mm-hmm. But a lot of people have career gaps for other reasons. If they went sure. to rehab, that's a no-brainer. We understand that. But other mm-hmm. things like, you know, a family member was sick um, and they took care of them or, you know, really anything, you know, you'd be surprised. That it runs the gamut what people deal with, right? Because life is just life. And so I think we have a greater understanding and a greater empathy for that. And, and um, yeah, we try to just really find good people because in, in our business, it's a little bit different than running a software company. The mm-hmm. people matter even more because they are the yeah. whole product. Like you're... Yeah. We're selling people's time effectively, right? I'd love, to, I'd love to claim that it's more sophisticated than that, but it probably isn't, right? right? So we need people who have really strong character. And if they've been through something that's, you know, dis- put, put on display their ability to handle adversity, we know that the regular nine to five job functions, they'll easily be able to tackle. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, so. That's so true. So it just, but it, we like to get to know people on a personal level, you know, it's just, it just opens the door. Um, for a lot of our employees to come forth, even after they start working with us and say, I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that. And we get a chance to help them. And that's the most rewarding thing ever. You know, when someone comes to me and tells me something voluntarily, we just do everything we can do to help them. I mean, there's a story where, I mean, my first week at Google in 2014, 
my best friend passed away from cancer. He was 23. Oh. And um, he had testicular cancer. He recovered from it. And then it came back and spread to his lungs. He died. And oh. my manager at the time came, said to me, take as much time as you want, literally, uncapped, and we'll just pay you the whole time. You come back when you're ready. That was at Google. Wow. So even before I had this experience of getting sober and all that, I learned what a real employer does in supporting their people. Sure. And that's why Google has the reputation that they have with culture, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, that, that forever changed my life. I, I had nothing to offer Google at the time. They hadn't even trained me. I knew nothing about digital marketing. Yet I was on payroll for at least a month while I was at home in Florida doing nothing. And they, and they did that. So for me to be able to do that for things like that for my employees, it's just, dude, it makes it worth, it makes everything worth it. What advice do you have for uh, maybe another CEO or entrepreneur who has not experienced what you've experienced? in helping them perhaps change their perception, um, rethink their hiring practices. How do you, is, is, there a, is there a place they could go? I mean, who would they talk to about learning about this? Great question. I mean, I would just say that, um, you know, listen to your employees and just mm. articulate that you are willing to accommodate them and support them in their personal matters and right. see if people are willing to open up and then just go do that. You know, they say they need this or they need that. Just go go do it. Implement it at the company, you know. I don't think you have to be – I don't think the fact that I went through this sobriety experience makes me, you know, better than a, another potential leader. It just makes makes it so that I can – I have like a, a softer spot, I suppose, for these types of issues. But there's so many people that can do, be, do the same exact thing by just listening to what their workforce is saying. Because life is so hard that if you haven't experienced something, you know, to that degree, chances are you will at some point. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. we can learn a lot yeah. of things in life through just just listening and learning to other people, you know, and, and having their experiences inform inform us. Yeah, I, I also think that this very platform where we met on LinkedIn is is one of the best ways to do that. There are not a lot of you, but there are people out there like you sharing their story. And you were extremely receptive when I reached out and said, hey, Kevin, I'd like to learn more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and the fact that you're willing, and, and by the way, that's the point of this podcast. I don't make any money off this thing. Um, but like you said, if two people listen to this, I just, I just doubled my audience, by the way, when I said that. <laughs> if, uh, if, if people listen to this, and like you said, they might, it might register with them, but it might, it might be something they can go talk to a friend yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly and say there are companies out there that are willing to talk to you and give you a chance and let you know this doesn't define you and it's so important um, yeah and i just I, I feel like the other thing i wanted to mention is i had the fortune of getting sober in san francisco where there was young community i know mm -hmm. countless people in my home state of florida that tried to get sober there and couldn't and the reason oh, is interesting the reason is the, the the general population in the state of florida is much older and so those people didn't get inspired because they felt they couldn't relate. And I think that would have happened to me. You know, I, I, I had the luxury of being around people that were in their 20s that were trying to do better. Like, I didn't gain the confidence to be like this in sobriety. I didn't have that naturally at all. I had the, in fact, I had the exact opposite. Really? I gained it by watching other people and, and I, they had what I wanted. I, I literally... I asked guys that I thought were cool in the AA program if I could hang out. Right. And how, no kidding. Yeah, and how can I be more like them? And so I really feel for the people in Florida or other states that are trying to get sober where it's not an appealing thing to do. It's just it's tough. It's tough. You can't – it's hard to get inspired. I, I had the fortune of being able to be inspired by people, you know, on a regular that basis. Is so – that is so interesting. Yeah, it's a huge that, that thing. People it's a huge, yeah, I mean, huge, huge. And now in Los Angeles, I mean, people are, there's countless celebrities, actresses, actors, people who are really prominent that are celebrating their sobriety. But, and I get to see that firsthand, which can propel me to stay sober another day or another week, another month. But it's hard. It's, it's hard if you don't have that example, like in front of your eyes. So how does, uh, how does... AA or other groups, how do they address that? I never even thought about demographics. I never thought about walking into an AA meeting in, you know, Orlando yeah. versus San Francisco and that being an issue. 
you know, they don't, it, it, people show up, you know, you come as you are. So there's no, yeah. you know, it's like a confidential situation. So no one really talks about anything work related. You're just, mm-hmm. the, the disease doesn't discriminate. So people from all yeah. walks of life, you know, every ethnicity, every socioeconomic status, doesn't matter. You just all, that's a melting pot. Wow. That's interesting to think about. Um, so let's pivot again back to, to grow. What's the vision for the business? Stay focused on SEO, double down. That's what you do. Are there other services you're going to start to branch out to? What, what are you guys thinking? Well, um, we are dead focused on SEO right now. However, there are a few programs in the works that we, um, we are going to roll out. So the first will be Google ads. The reason okay. is I've got a deep expertise in that from my time working at Google, but also, and much more importantly, it's a direct complement to what we're doing on the sure. SEO side. Most brands want their SEO strategy and their SEM strategy to be in lockstep with one another, and any good strategy is. So we are starting to offer that. We have a six-person team that does Google Ads. It hasn't been publicly announced yet, but it will be soon. And so that is kind of what we're focused on right now, and our whole thesis as a company right now is that we help brands and capture intent online, whether it's paid or organic. Okay. I think at certain some point down the road, we could become um, an agency that has multiple service offerings, but we will only ever offer a new service if we feel like we're uniquely positioned to offer it. Like we're, we're actually sure. better at executing than other people. For example, we'll probably never offer Facebook ads. We'll probably never right. offer Instagram ads. We'll probably never buy ads on TikTok. The reason is there's other people that are out there that are practitioners that are simply better than us. So right. unless we've put in our 10,000 hours to be like an absolute domain expert, we know we can deliver a great value for the cost, we're not going to do it. So right now we just do SEO and SEM. What per, you know, when you think about your clients, what percentage of those people are driving intent back to e-commerce where there's a transaction or driving them back to, you know, fill a lead, fill a form or what, what, what is the, what is the business focus? For us, it's probably about 90% that are, you know, intent focused. So 90% of our customers are direct consumer e-commerce companies on Shopify or, you know, people who are on Shark Tank um, or maybe have a little bit of venture funding. 5% is B2B and 5% is publicly traded technology companies. Got it. Got it. So there, this is really great for someone who says, I want to get them to my site to buy something. You guys have Absolutely. figured that yep. figured that out. Yep. E-commerce okay. SEO is where we specialize. That's our core competency. Perfect. That's great. Um, how, how, how much more hiring this year? Guess I've been, I, by the way, are you guys all virtual? 100% virtual? No. So we actually, we have a great office in, in Playa Vista, um, 30,000 okay. square feet. There's only, wow. there's only 20 of us that come in right now, but the capacity is probably about 75. Um, okay. We have, yeah, let's call it an even round number at about 100 employees total. Sure. 80 of those are representing the other 48 states. Oh, wow. You know, two, two, we're still looking for Alaska and Hawaii. Um, actually, I think we just, we just hired a recruiter who's living in Hawaii now. So one unrepresented state. And then uh, the remainder are in the Los Angeles area. About That's 15 awesome. to 20 come into the office. Yeah. So... So through the rest of the year, I think we'll probably get to about 140, maybe 150 employees, which is just will be mind mind blowing if we can do it. You'll experience this, right? But when you get to 50 people, particularly in one building, things change. Yeah, right. It's got to process some things. HR becomes a thing. It does. Right? It does absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and rightfully so. I mean, it should be right. There should be should be thinking about how to how to think ahead of employees and be proactive in how how, how that culture dominates. You get to 200 people. Shit really gets. Oh my god! I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. The first time, the first time you walk in the door, well, maybe it's already happened, Kevin. We don't recognize somebody, don't know their name. Then you're like, "What just happened?" Here? I hope that never happens, but I, you know, I'm sure it will at some point if we if we continue to be successful. But uh, I mean, that would be weird. Yeah. I mean, my, my parents are going to come out here two weekends from now, and they'll be the first time they'll have been in California for four years, so they've never seen any of this. So I'll be, I'm interested to see oh. their reaction. Of what what they think, yeah. How exciting! Now, what to, what do you do uh, away from work to keep you balanced, focused, and decompress? I try to go on hikes and I try to work out. Those are two okay, things good. that have become you know big for me. Um, I used to have a dog. That's why I paused. wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about this, but I had a girlfriend for multiple years. We ended up breaking up at the end of last year, but we had a dog together. 
And so I used to spend a ton of time with this dog. Love him to death. Um, don't see him as much now, but I spent a lot of time doing that, and that was probably my greatest joy outside of work. But other than that, yeah, I just try to hang out with people I don't work with. <laughs> because I it, it, I totally, it allows me I to totally just take my mind off of work entirely. Um, you know, I, I don't want, I, I'm going to give you a chance to, to refute this, but it sounded to me like you missed the dog way most. Way more <laughs> I won't comment on that, but yeah, definitely <laughs> some truth, some truth to that. I could see some emotion there too, yeah. by the way. And I have a feeling if my wife had to make, make a choice, I think I'd lose by the way as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Could, yeah. You know, that's uh, fair. I understand that. I'm sure she feels the same way too. <laughs> I'm sure she does. I'm sure she does. Yeah. You know, Kevin, any any last thoughts for, um, I know we talked about other CEOs who may be growing businesses to think about, but, you know, if you could talk to that one person who's listening to this, who is dealing with an addiction, doesn't know who to talk to, who's the first person you think they, they should reach out to that, that they wouldn't even think about? Hmm. Well, some of the toughest things for a lot of people who are looking to get help is they don't know anybody else who's in recovery. That's a big problem. Uh, so unfortunately, what you got to do is go to aa.org and look for a meeting, hopefully in person, that's within you know your general physical proximity, and just and it. just get get yourself there somehow, some way when you're really motivated, and announce that you're new and you need help. You know that's that's the best way to do it. That's what I did in San Francisco. I just went, I looked it up online, and mm -hmm. I went. Thank God there were people there that I met that were overly welcoming to me and, and yeah. introduced me to the next person. But that's what I would say is, is the best thing to do. I mean, or if anyone listening to this, just reach out to me, you know, and I'll get you yeah. on Zoom meetings. So I'm happy to do that. If someone doesn't want to go, no one wants to really talk to a stranger, especially about this subject matter. So, uh, you know, I can set people up very quickly in any city, no questions asked. Well, and we'll put how to reach Kevin in the show notes for sure. But, you know, Kevin, that's a great way to leave this. And, and the reason it's so important is you give them a bit of hope, right? They know that if they go do this, they can live the life that you're living now. It's not going to be easy. Yeah. But they can do I it. I think ultimately, you know, I've noticed one thing about alcoholics and addicts. They're, they're rarely average people. You know, they really just want to yeah. – uh, they're all or nothing, you know, like they might yeah. be a huge, you know, just like gambling addicts, right? Like you want to win a ton of money or zero. So that tr translated to my life. Like I want to be married. I want to have kids. I want to be financially secure. And I want to experience stuff that maybe not the average person does. So I, you know, I didn't get sober to just have that be what defines me. I want to, you know, be a, a great person who happens to be sober. You know, and that's the that's the reason why. But it doesn't um, preclude me from having fun. Doesn't preclude me from doing anything in life. Yeah. So that's what motivated me. Is like I, I just made a decision one day that the life that I want and the life I was living are completely divergent. And if I kept doing what I was doing, I would never get what I think I have now or where I think I'm headed. Still don't have the wife and the kids, but I hope that it'll come through you know this behavior. You know what? That's so solid, and you're right. I think a lot of people that experience what you've experienced are highly functional in specific areas of their life, right? They just they uh, they run at a higher level, yeah. and sometimes everything runs at that level. Yep. Right, and that balance is difficult to obtain. Uh, Kevin, once again, I first of all, I, I just enjoyed every aspect of this conversation, both professionally and personally. And, and you're right, I'm in your corner now. I'm a fan. Thank you, thank you. I and uh, I'll, I'm here to help in any way possible. Uh, you know, as you guys grow and, and there to be someone you can reach out to and just chat at any point as well. The feeling's mutual. Yeah, that's great. And thanks so much for sharing. Everyone, that was, uh, in my mind, one of the best episodes we've ever done. Hope you enjoyed it. You can find Kevin in the show notes. And thanks for tuning in to Eating Crow. Ah! Ah! Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video.